Greetings, ladies and gents. <clears throat> Welcome to chapter one, or the very, very beginning, where we will discuss what physics is. So what is physics? Yes, I've already mentioned before that physics is the study of the physical world, the laws which govern existence. Once upon a time, it was called natural philosophy by the ancient Greeks. However, <clears throat> people that had been using critical thinking to solve problems <coughs> and come up with clever solutions to these problems for a long time before the ancient Greeks had got a hold of it. Now the book, the textbook for this course, says that measurements are important for science and that is true, indeed they are. If you recall at the very beginning we said that the deeper that you can go with the math the, or deep, the deeper your understanding will be <clears throat> and the reason that this is a conceptual physics course, or a course that's only focusing on the core concepts, is that we are not going too deep into the mathematics that surround or are involved with a lot of the problem solving. So, we're basically just going to scratch the surface on a lot of these things. Also, the more accurately you can measure something, the closer to the truth you are. <clears throat> Once upon a time, they tried to write into law that the number pi was the number 3, and that did not work, as I'm sure you can probably guess. People tried to make wheels that had a ratio of diameter to circumference of 3, and it was impossible. That's just not how that works, okay? <clears throat> the more your measurements are off, you can really, really mess up really big. Once upon a time, Lockheed Martin put together a satellite called the Mars Climate Orbiter, and they lost it. It cost something like $193.1 million of taxpayer money, and they lost it, because some bonehead decided that he was going to use feet instead of meters. Now, I don't care what you think about feet and meters. We're using meters in this course because the world over uses the metric system for science. Okay, So we're going to be using scientific units, not feet, not yards, not miles. Those are all ridiculous and arbitrary. Okay, The metric system has everything on powers of 10. <coughs> so you have a meter, 10 meters is a decameter. 10 of those, or 100 meters, is a hectometer. 10 of those, or 1,000 meters, is a kilometer, and so on. Okay? And so everything makes a lot more logical sense. So we're going to use the metric system, because only here in the States are we backward enough to use the feet and yards and miles imperial system, which is total nonsense. You know where the foot came from? It was supposed to be the size of Charlemagne's foot. The yard was supposed to be the distance from the end of Charlemagne's nose to the end of his outstretched hand. What kind of unit of measurement is that? You know how big a mile is? Anybody know how big a mile is? It's 5,280 feet. Where did they get that number? That also means that one mile is 1,760 yards. Because a yard is three feet. We're not going to use any of that nonsense, okay? <clears throat> There's a meter, it's about a little over three feet, three foot three, something like that. And a kilometer is 1,000 of those. End of story. Okay? <clears throat> now, once upon a time, the ancient thinkers, people in our history, came up with a lot of really interesting knowledge, figured a lot of interesting things out. <clears throat> they were able to figure out from our orbit around the sun basically how big the sun is using basically the ancient ancestor to the pinhole camera. <clears throat> um, a guy named Eratosthenes was able to figure out the size of the earth from looking at the shadow <clears throat> of two objects in different cities on a certain day of the year. I'm going to introduce you now to a good friend of mine, the white boar. We're going to become very well acquainted with the white boar over the course of the semester. Okay, get this stupid thing to center itself. Oh, try it. 
edge it a little bit closer. That's not bad. Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> this person, Eratosthenes, oh, they just stole them. Uh, hold on just one second. Oh, my cat stole my, that's my pens. Okay. This will make a suitable uh, replacement. <coughs> so, here's the Earth. Um, this is the astrophysical symbol for the Earth. It's a circle with a plus in it, right? It's the Earth. In any case, uh, let's say the Sun is, you know, way, way, way far away. Obviously, all the light from the Sun is basically going to come down towards the Earth <coughs> as if the Sun was some little spot in the sky, just like it looks. It's uh, about a half a degree circle, right? It's a little glowing dot in the sky that's super bright. That's the sun, right? <coughs> and so essentially, it looks to us, because the sun is very, very far away, something like 150 million kilometers from the Earth. And at that distance, the sun is very small, it appears to be very small, right? Although it's really not, it's almost a million kilometers across. Yeah, something like 864,000 kilometers across the sun. In any case, because the sun is so small, or appears so small in the sky because it's so far away, <coughs> basically it looks like all the light is coming from that little dot in the sky. And so, let's say that you're at some place on the Earth, and the light from the sun is coming down and it hits this well, right? And the well casts absolutely no shadow whatsoever. So you can kind of say that the sun, I mean, the astrophysical symbol for the sun, is a circle with a dot in it, right? a single dot. In any case, um, <coughs> if On a certain time, on a certain day of the year, the sun is directly above the well, it'll cast no shadow, right? Now, if you were at some other place looking at a well, and on that same day, you know, if it's March 22nd or whatever it is, and on this day it casts no shadow here, if you were here <coughs> and this shadow, the, this well had just a little bit of a shadow, right? If it had, you know, some shadow that was like seven degrees, right? <clears throat> then you would be able to figure out that the angle from the center of the Earth in between these is also seven degrees, right? Because the light that comes from the sun always goes in a straight line. Now, <clears throat> this guy Eratosthenes knew how far apart these two cities were, what the distance in between the two cities was. And because there was a special relation in between what we call the arc length, or the length along the surface of a circle, or a sphere, or whatever, and the angle in between these two, and the radius of the object, <coughs> and that relation is something like the arc length is equal to the radius times the angle. Don't worry, we're going to go over this again when we talk about circular geometries and circular motion. But suffice to say, because Eratosthenes knew how far apart these were, which is basically the arc length in between these two places, and knew what the angle was because he knew what the angle of the shadow was, a long, long time ago, this person Eratosthenes, this ancient Greek, was able basically to figure out how big the Earth was, the radius or the size of the Earth. Pretty clever, right? <clears throat> the ancient Greeks were able to figure out that the Earth was round a long time before the Flat Earth Society decided to be a bunch of idiots. Which, if you're a Flat Earther, the Earth is not flat, okay? <laughs> how do we know? <clears throat> well, uh, there is an image in the description, uh, the chapter one page, that shows the Earth's shadow on the moon. 
And if you want to make some crazy argument about how the moon is flat too, and the sun is also flat, uh, if you look through a telescope, you can very clearly see <coughs> toward the periphery that there is curvature on the face of the moon. Pretty simple. <coughs> In any case, the shape of the Earth's shadow on the moon is round. That means the Earth also has to be round in order for it to cast a round shadow on the moon. Crazy, right? That people still believe the Earth is flat. <coughs> in any case, um, because the Earth's shadow is much larger than the moon, even though the moon is generally something like 300,000 kilometers from the Earth, <coughs> Because the Earth's shadow is so much larger than the Moon, Aristarchus of Samos also realized that the Earth must much that it must be much larger than the Moon, which indeed it is. Aristarchus of Samos also came up with this crazy idea, back then people thought it was crazy, that the Sun was at the center of the solar system. Now what's significant about that is that he came up with this idea almost 2,000 years before <coughs> Uh, Johannes Kepler and the Copernican Revolution <coughs> and uh, the widespread acceptance of the fact that the Sun is at the center of the solar system. So people came up with a lot of interesting things, people knew a lot of things a long time ago before we had sophisticated technology and sophisticated mathematics. <coughs> so that begs the question, why do we use math in science? Well. For a lot of reasons, not the least of which is numbers are the same in any language. And so math is sort of a universal language. If you can express a relationship in between certain physical quantities, things like the radius of the Earth <coughs> and the distance in between two points on the surface of the Earth, if you can express these in terms of a relationship, a, an equation, then you definitely know something about it, right? <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the scientific method. What is the scientific method? And why do we always tout it? Why do we talk about it so often? Well, it is a free-form method of discovery <clears throat> that we use to find answers in the universe. Basically, it's like a blueprint for thinking critically. You can never prove something right but you can definitely prove things wrong. Now there are three main pieces <coughs> to, excuse me, I should probably be honest. There are three main pieces to this puzzle, three main portions to the scientific method. Those of course are experimentation, Analysis <coughs> and hypothesis. Now I know what the book says. The book says step one is recognize a question puzzle or an unexplained fact. Usually in physics we call this the formulation of the problem. Um, Step two, make a hypothesis or an educated guess. And this is where the book starts to go wrong about this because this isn't necessarily first. Because you may just come up with a crazy idea and want to come up with an experiment. That's how things could start. Or you may analyze somebody else's experiment or hypothesis and start there. You may realize that somebody made a mistake and that might lead you to a new idea or to a different experiment. And so really, you can start here and go there, you can start here and go there, right? It's preform. You might <coughs> start with an experiment and then through analysis realize that you need to come up with a whole new hypothesis or whatever. <coughs> 
anyway, the book says that from there you predict the consequences, that you perform experiments, and that it goes in a certain order, and that's not always true. And the lesson here is to admit when you're wrong. If your hypothesis is wrong, then you won. You did it correctly. <clears throat> Remember, you can't prove things right, but you can disprove things. And if you disproved something, you did good. Now, just a little bit of voc vocabulary here. A fact is an agreement based on observations about a phenomenon. We say 1 plus 1 equals 2 is a fact, right? A hypothesis is a guess. <clears throat> Something is a hypothesis if you can test whether or not it's wrong. Okay? Now I'm going to read you four hypotheses. And these are also in uh, the class notes or the lecture notes. <clears throat> One, protons carry an electric charge. Two, undetectable particles are some of nature's secrets. C, or three, excuse me, charged particles bend when in a magnetic field. And finally, number four, all of the above are scientific hypotheses. Now, which one of these is not a hypothesis? If you said that undetectable particles are some of nature's secrets, then you were correct because there is no test for incorrectness if the particles are undetectable. We call this the dark matter problem. <clears throat> we don't know what most of the matter in any given galaxy is because we are not able to see it. It doesn't give off light, and therefore, we call it dark matter. Now, just a little bit more uh, vocabulary. A law or a principle is a hypothesis that has been tested repeatedly and has not been contradicted or disproven. Things like Newton's laws, Kepler's laws, <coughs> the uh, theory of relativity, for example, things like that. <coughs> And that brings me to my next point. A theory is a synthesis of a large body of information that encompasses well-tested and verified hypotheses about certain aspects of the natural world. <clears throat> now, I know what the danger is, that probably some idiot has probably told you very wrongfully that theories are just theories. And we call them theories because we don't know if they're wrong or not. And that's nonsense. Okay? <clears throat> Just because something is a theory definitely doesn't mean that it's wrong. Let's take, for example, the theory of evolution. The reason that the Catholic Church had to take back their stance on evolution is that it has generations of factual evidence to back it up, so much so that even the Pope because he was an analytical thinker, could not deny its validity. And so the Catholic Church had to recant its stance on the theory of evolution. Because it is, it is fact. It is proven. And anybody who tries to tell you otherwise doesn't understand it. If someone says the Big Bang Theory is, a just, is just a theory, then they don't know about the cosmic microwave background radiation, or the expansion of the universe, or the upper age limit for radioactive isotopes in the universe, or all of this incredibly strong evidence we have that a Big Bang happened at one point in the history of the universe. Now, do theories and laws change over time? Yes, of course. <clears throat> and generally, the reason that we call something a theory is that sometimes we realize that this thing that we knew, this body of evidence that we had, is actually part of a larger puzzle. For example, <clears throat> if you remember, I hinted at the fact that there are these things called conservation laws because there are some things that are conserved, things like matter and energy, right? So there is a law of conservation of and let's say matter. Basically, <clears throat> you might burn something, you might 
freeze something, you might liquefy something, but all of the protons, neutrons, and electrons that make up any kind of matter are still there regardless of whatever you do to it, right? There is also a law of conservation of energy. Basically, you can have some energy stored in a battery or in fuel for your car or you can lift something up so that it has greater gravitational potential energy. You can throw something so that it has kinetic energy, etc. <clears throat> but I had to put energy into the pen in order to throw it, right? Basically, the amount of energy in the universe remains constant. Now, <clears throat> it was thought for a long time that these two quantities were conserved separately, but thanks to Albert Einstein, we know that there is an equivalence between energy and matter. And so these two things, while they appear separate, are actually pieces of a larger puzzle. That's why we call them theories, not because the theory of relativity is wrong. About a hundred years after Einstein predicted gravity waves, <coughs> we were able to prove them, I believe in 2005, I think that was September 16th the Laser Interferometry, Interferometry Gravitational Observatory, or LIGO, L-I-G-O, proved that there were gravity waves that were sent out through the universe when two black holes merged. So, if anybody ever tells you that something is wrong because it's a theory, or that it can't be right because it's a theory or it's just a theory and so maybe it's not correct you tell them to go and take a long walk off a short pier okay science is knowledge <coughs> technology is the application of that knowledge to make tools or devices to help <coughs> science is divided into different kinds of science of course there are physical sciences like astronomy chemistry physics etc <coughs> and there are life sciences things like biology botany now, all sciences, all of them, are applications of what we're doing here, physics. We only know about the structure of the periodic table, <coughs> the structure of the atom, and basically most of chemistry because of quantum mechanics, a branch of physics. And for that reason, a lot of times they say that chemistry is really just applied physics, like, all of, like basically everything else. However, physics also requires the least amount of rote memorization because it is fundamental. If you understand what this means, energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared, or if you take a little bit of matter and convert it into energy, you get a lot of energy because of this c squared factor, c of course being the speed of light. And so if you can understand what these relations are, the fundamental principle, then you don't need to memorize a whole lot of things. And that's why lazy people like myself like to study physics. In any case, <coughs> I hope you have enjoyed Chapter 1. I'll see you next week for Chapter 2.